is the final installment of Philadelphia Fight's very first annual Virtual Health Equity Speaker Series. My name is Dion Powell, and I'm General Counsel and Chief Legal Officer here at Philadelphia Fight. We set out earlier this month to lead, uplift, educate, and galvanize our communities to promote better health outcomes with the goal of meeting people where they are. We saw this series of webinars as an opportunity to build awareness about health disparities and to provide communities with the information that they need to take action. Over the past four weeks, we shared a sit down with our very own Dr. Annette Gadabeku, who shared with us her experiences as a clinical leader in the community health space and what her goals are as the new director of adult medicine here at Philadelphia Fight. We uplifted Black women's voices with this program called Treating This Disease Called Strength. There, we focused on the concept of the strong Black woman and the downsides to that social construct when it came to seeking to help seeking behaviors for African-American women in the space of mental health. Most recently, we were joined by attorney Jacqueline Romero, who shared with us her decades of experience representing entities against discrimination for folks living with HIV and AIDS, and also introducing us to the new era of discrimination against folks who are dealing with medically assisted treatment in the opioid epidemic. Today, we're going to kick it off or cap off our, our series of events with a presentation from Dr. Charlene Flash, one of our sibling FQHCs located in Houston, Texas. Firmly rooted in this year's theme of meeting people where they are, we hopefully convey that being an informed and an engaged community member is one of the most powerful ways to create change. We can help raise awareness about health disparities that continue to affect people, especially people of color, and encourage action at all levels of government and be advocates for health in the communities that we all live, work, play, and learn. The final presentation will last about an hour and 15 minutes, and although the chat box will be disabled, we encourage you to use the question and answer box because there will be a question and answer section at the end. So here we are. And now without further ado, I'll introduce you to our very own Dr. Stacy Truskin, who's the medical director here at Philadelphia Fight, who's going to introduce today's speaker. Again, thank you all for joining us and you are in for a very substantial program. Thank you, Dr. Truskin. Thank you, Dion. Well, it is a distinct honor and privilege to introduce to you all my dear friend and colleague, Charlene Flash. Dr. Flash is the president and CEO of Avenue 360 Health and Wellness, a, non, a nine site health system in Houston that provides cradle to grave care while addressing social determinants of health such as housing instability, food insecurity and racism. Dr. Flash is an infectious disease physician who holds voluntary faculty appointments as an associate professor at the University of Houston and at Bay Baylor College of Medicine as an assistant professor of medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases. She provides primary care to people living with HIV and her research addresses health disparities, HIV testing, prevention and treatment and implementation science. Dr. Flash implemented one of the first HIV prevention programs in the United States to provide HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis to high-risk heterosexuals outside of a clinical trial. Dr. Flash is a graduate of Yale University and of Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School and Rutgers School of Public Health. She completed a medicine pediatric residency at Brown University and an adult infectious disease fellowship at Harvard Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. Dr. Flash is married with three children, the oldest of which is my, god, my goddaughter. And I am uh, going to take a personal moment here because it's not every day I get to introduce my best friend um, in a venue like this. And I want you all to know that I met Dr. Flash the very first day of medical school, almost 23 years ago. And since then, I have been lucky enough to have a front row seat to witness what an extraordinary physician, educator, leader, researcher, wife, mother, she is. And I can tell you that with all of those incredible accomplishments, you could not find a better best friend. So I am so delighted to be able to share her with you all today. So you get a little taste of what I've gotten for the last 23 years. And I hope you all learn as much from her as I do every day. So thank you. And thanks for being here, Shar. 
Oh, Stacy, you're not supposed to get me teared up at the beginning of a talk, but thank you for that very warm welcome. I would like to thank my dear friend, Stacy Truskin, Dr. Truskin, as well as the CEO at Philadelphia Fight, Jane Schull, and her wonderful team, um, Kyle Schwasta and attorney Dion Powell for leading me through this process, as well as for my marketing communications team for getting my slides prepared and getting me ready for this moment. Um, it is my honor to have been invited to share some of my experience with you and to talk a bit about galvanizing communities for a healthier tomorrow. So with that, let me share my slides. So today we're going to talk about galvanizing communities for a healthier tomorrow. So by way of disclosure, um, Stacy has also already mentioned that I'm the president and CEO of a health system in Houston called Avenue 360 Health and Wellness and hold um, two faculty appointments. Um, I also um, am on the scientific review committee for Gilead Sciences Research Scholars Program in HIV. You know, so much of who we are stems from our own stories. So for context, I want to share a little bit of my story. As a young girl, I was born in uh, Brooklyn, New York, a first generation American of Jamaican descent. Um, I grew up in Connecticut with my family, my immigrant family. Uh, my father had a very entrepreneurial spirit. So um, he was an attorney and an MBA and he put out his own shingle and started his own law firm. Um, and at that time, as he was just starting out, he had no health insurance. Now on the street where I grew up, I was nestled between two communities. Um, one, a working class community, and one, um, a very um, disenfranchised community. And my home was kind of right on the border of those two communities. And at the end of the street was our family physician. His office was in a, a, a renovated home um, in New England. Um, the waiting room was overrun with patients. The front desk assistant doubled as a medical assistant and your access to the doctor really depended on how overwhelmed she felt that day. I can remember one day after hours waiting to be seen, uh, my mom poked me and said, would you just vomit in the waiting room so we can get taken back? And I dutifully obeyed and we were immediately brought back to see the physician. You know, we would pay him when we could, which was not all of the time. And he kept taking care of me and of my family through over the years. He was patient and wise and had healing hands and a healing touch and, and wise words that I think at some times were as good medicine as the prescriptions that he gave me. Many of his wise words still resonate in my ears even today. And it's in part the impact that he had on me at those impressionable years that accompanied by my parents' mandate as an immigrant family from Jamaica who said, listen, you can be a lawyer, a doctor, or an engineer. Those are the careers that secure success and financial security in the United States and will garner you respect that will counter society's prejudices. So as I tried to find myself, um, I was going through my youth and I experienced multiple experiences that um, were enlightening and disturbing all at once. You know, I, my family came from a culture where um, people of color are the dominant culture, the lawyers, the doctors, um, the political figures are all black people. And you came to the United States and that was not the same imagery that you were met with day to day. In fact, I can remember a family friend who dared to purchase a home on the north side of town, having a cross burned on her lawn. I can remember my first boyfriend who uh, had been studying with me in the public library and took the bus to his home and was walking to his home. And all of a sudden, three police cars come up and um, they throw him on the ground and draw their guns on him. I can remember my first year at Yale walking across the green from old campus, coming out the high street gate and crossing the street and a white man on a bicycle biking up to me and pushing me down into the street, 
get out of my way, nigger, you don't belong here. So, so much, these, these, these moments in time and these experience that I had, um, they really shaped my experience. And in so many ways, I thought to myself, I don't want to be trapped in a future that's dictated by the color of my skin. I want to be the change uh, that, that I would like to see. When I think about the past, and the gremlins in my computer are making this pass forward, but uh, we'll work through it here, um, that in today's reality, um, there are many disparities that are driven by some of the ugly perspectives um, that I described to you in my own personal life exper experiences. As we look at things like infant mortality, like mental health, like H rates of HIV, like rates of diabetes, breast cancer, cancer, I could go on and on. And for each of these, you see rates of illness, rates of death, timing of diagnosis, timing of linkage to care that are profoundly different than what you see in white communities. People may try to apply biological reasoning to explain why these things are happening. But I would posit that the key drivers of health inequities in our country are grounded in things that we don't often like to admit happens in the United States of America, um, that they are grounded in racism and unhealthy environments and social pressures and limitations and in poor access to healthcare. I think, you know, sometimes it's hard to articulate um, these challenges or even to voice words like racism. It even makes me cringe as I shape the words in my own mouth. But Harriet Washington, the author of a fascinating book called Medical Apartheid, wrote that trying to understand the current problems of Blacks and healthcare without understanding this history is like trying to treat a patient without eliciting a thorough medical history. So with that, I want us to take a moment to consider the historical context where all of us sit at this moment. In the 1950s, Harry Bailey, um, who was a clinician at Tulane University, was doing experiments on black prisoners and said it was cheaper to use um, black folks described differently um, there than cats. Um, in Philadelphia, where many of our audience reside at present, black men had various experimental medical procedures conducted on them at the Holmesburg prison. They were exposed intentionally to herpes, gonorrhea, malaria, dysentery. In, in Ohio State's prison, 300 black inmates were injected with live cancer cells so that doctors at Sloan Kettering could study the effects. In the 70s, we saw the Tuskegee experiment where black men didn't receive access to penicillin, though it had been discovered many years before. And uh, the study that was supposed to last six months last 40 years. And these men never received um, treatment during that 40 year period. In the 1990s, black and Hispanic children were given doses of fenfluramine to test a theory that violence or criminal behavior could be predicted he could be predicted by levels of certain brain chemicals. And these children were between the ages of six and 10 years of age. But I'm, as I think about my own life and I think about what shaped my career choices um, and my commitment to uh, the community, I have to tell you that when I was coming along, the ills of the season were cancer and AIDS. In the 1980s, this mysterious illness appeared in the United States, um, improperly described as GRID, gay-related infectious disease. And by 1986, more than half of all new AIDS cases were among Black individuals, three times higher than white adults, um, even though uh, Black people only comprise approximately 11 to 12 percent of the U.S. population. Nearly half of these individuals died from AIDS. And the contributing factors of that time were federal government inaction, poverty, lack of access to health care, lack of awareness of their HIV status, and stigma. During that season, I was 
trying to figure out what would I do with myself. And I was bright eyed and bushy tailed enough to say at that time, I want to end the HIV epidemic. I saw it as an opportunity to not only touch individual lives, but to impact entire communities. And I was particularly disturbed by the changes that I saw in my own community where the community support that you would normally give to someone. You see someone's car break down on the side of the road and you go over to give them a hand. I saw my own family pause and say, well, I don't have gloves and maybe they're bleeding and maybe I'll catch AIDS if I go and help them. The lack of information and the fear um, in the community uh, was palpable. I remember a young woman who worked with my mother um, and had two children that were about the age of myself and my younger brother, who all of a sudden died for reasons that were unclear. And the rumor mill began to spin and we found out that she had died of AIDS. And the hush hush that surrounded her life and the bullying that her children uh, experienced even as they grieved their mother's death impacted me profoundly. And I realized that this disease that in the media was framed as something that impacted um, only the LGBTQ community also impacted women. As I was in this period of, of figuring out what I wanted to do with my life, although my parents had said, listen, you could be a lawyer or a doctor or whatever, after I graduated from college, to their chagrin, I decided to take three years off and to figure out what I wanted to do. At that time, I worked uh, at a nonprofit called the Sabin Vaccine Institute. And there I was able to see people who were doctors and researchers and public health officials. I met scientists and researchers. I met the Surgeon General. I saw all of these people. And at the end of the day, I realized that my parents were right. <laughs> Indeed, I wanted to be a doctor. But it was during that phase that I realized that I wanted to be a clinician because I wanted to touch individual people's lives. But I also wanted to get a master's in public health because I wanted to impact the health of entire communities. And this vision that I had that I wanted to work towards ending the HIV epidemic, um, I wanted to make sure that I had all the credentials in line because I recognized that at that season, um, a black woman could not make such a bold goal come to fruition if she didn't have the right credentials behind her name. So I went out to the best schools and I got as much education as I could as I tried to figure out how I would be the change that I wanted to see. But as someone had gone, who had gone back to medical school, both Stacy and I shared the story where we both went back to, we went to medical school, not directly after college. And as students who were a little um, older, slightly older than our classmates, we also had an uncanny focus as we realized that both of us had in mind what our vision and our goals were. And so where others were just going to school to go to school, we were going to school with purpose. And so even as a medical student, I worked at an organization called Hip Hop, the Homeless and Indigent Population Health Outreach Project. And two of my friends completed a needs assessment and realized that these homeless individuals didn't have access to healthcare. So we said, we're gonna start a healthcare program. And we go down to the soup kitchen and um, encourage the patients who had missed their appointments to come down the block to a Catholic charities facility to receive their health care, um, where we worked with 15 family medicine clinicians to provide care in the evenings um, to these homeless individuals. And we, as bright-eyed, bushy-tailed medical students, would accompany them to their specialty appointments. We would help translate um, the medical mumbo jumbo into a language they couldn't understand. We would accompany them to their specialist appointments. And as I walked alongside these individuals and heard their stories, I realized that, but for the grace of God, go I, that many of these people had education and had experiences and actually shared some of the same uh, stories in their past that I had in my own biographical history. And I realized that the line between where we are and where we could be is very fine. It was at that point that I decided that a part of the solution also had to be becoming engaged in healthcare policy. 
And so at that time, I was working on um, encouraging um, New Jersey to encourage women who presented um, in childbirth without a known HIV status to get HIV testing completed and work with the health department and work with the department of OBGYN at um, then Robert Wood Johnson um, to get that moved forward. Um, and then when I moved on to my uh, residency in Rhode Island, did similar work um, at the state house to promote opt-out HIV testing. And I could see the dream coming to fruition. I went on to Boston to complete infectious disease fellowship in adult medicine. And when it came time to figure out what I would do uh, with my career and what step I would take next, I had a couple of offers and one of them was in Boston um, at the Fenway Institute. And the other was in Texas at Baylor College of Medicine. And uh, I can remember my colleagues and friends saying, well, of course you're going to take the job at Harvard, I mean, who turns off, who turns down a job like that? And what I shared with those folks who, if they knew me as well as they thought, they would have answered the question themselves is that my personal mission is to ensure cutting edge care in marginalized communities. And in Boston, there's an Ivy League trained clinician scholar on every corner. I was drawn to the state with the highest rate of uninsured in the country. I was drawn to the state that has, as you can see here, one of the highest rates of new HIV diagnoses in the country as the Southern region of the United States is truly in crisis in terms of the HIV epidemic. Of the 1.2 million people in the United States infected with HIV, and we know across the country about 20% of those people don't even know they're infected, the Southern US is particularly impacted and Texas ranks fourth in terms of new, new HIV infections. And more than half of those affect black people. Women of color comprise about 20% of new HIV infections and 66 of the infections among women, 66% are among black women, although they're only 12% of the US population of women. Texas has the dubious honor of having the highest percent of uninsured individuals in the nation. And as a non-Medicaid expansion state, um, these challenges persist even post Affordable Care Act. COVID has only served to worsen this challenge as over 1.2 million Texans have lost their health insurance after the COVID-19 in the face of job loss. You know, as I was trying to do this work to end the HIV epidemic, initially I thought, well, I'm going to establish healthcare programs that care for children and adults and hire people from communities to be involved in being the solution. And during that time, an interesting thing happened. A new drug was FDA approved for a new use. Um, this drug was uh, to be used for HIV prevention as a one tablet once a day. And that use was called pre-exposure prophylaxis. And I had the opportunity in moving to Texas um, to start one of the first programs that said, listen, I'm going to focus on high-risk heterosexuals and people of color. And what I found was that even in the face of a new technology, a disturbing um, thing was happening in that we know 12% of the US population is Black or African American. We know they comprise about 44% of all new infections. So then you would say, well, maybe 12% of PrEP prescriptions could, should go if we're going to just make it equitable and match the proportion of the population that they comprise. Or maybe since the majority of infections are happening in this community, 44% of prescriptions should go to this community. The disturbing truth was that only 10% of prescriptions were going to the community of greatest need. In part, this was due to poor access to healthcare in the most at-risk communities. In part, it was due to limited risk awareness among our most vulnerable. In part, it was due to lack of HIV prevention education, but there were also other things, uh, things that were um, profoundly impacting entire communities that were also driving these disparities, lack of stable housing, lack of transportation. And that these things were also impacting, but not only the access to 
uh, new uh, modalities such as PrEP, but also impacting the course of the HIV epidemic and many other healthcare challenges that impact the Black community. So people say, is there really a housing challenge um, amongst people of color? Well, uh, over the course of our history, people of color have experienced lower home ownership rates for decades. In fact, only 41% of Black households own their own home as compared to 73% of white households. And then even for those who rent, nearly one in four Black renters live in a county in which the Black ev eviction rate is more than double the white eviction rate. The, the, the problem goes deeper than just housing. We also must consider income equality, where Black families keep six cents for every dollar that a white family keeps. And as of 2020, the median household income was 41,000 for Black families, where it's 70,000 for white families. I think that there are many um, perspectives that people have as to why these inequalities and disparities dis exist. But I think that we have to consider that racism plays a role in this and that there are some race based memes that exist where whether you're black, white, Latin, indigenous, when you hear white, we often think wealthy, progressive, conventional, pulling up by your bootstraps, successful, educated, trustworthy. And when you hear black, you may think poor, violent, religious, lazy, cheerful, dangerous. And these, these memes and these perspectives, they impact what happens in our society in both overt ways and covert ways. The international pandemic that all of us has suffered through is right now, instead of being face to face so that you can raise your hand and ask me questions as I speak, we are all behind our computer screens we note that COVID has had a greater impact than just driving us all to technology. It has also exacerbated the challenges as the eviction and foreclosure rate of Black and Hispanic individuals increased by 7% as compared to 2% among individuals during this um, COVID pandemic. It's these types of challenges um, that drove me from that first uh, foray into the challenges of um, a major city in the Southern United States, um, working at an academic medical center and trying to impact change and provide research that would um, drive community change to saying, listen, this isn't moving fast enough for me. I love academia, I love science, I love determining the why. Um, but that in order to make change in a more profound and rapid way that I would need to go into the community. And so I moved uh, in to start working in the FQHC community, first at Legacy Community Health and now at Avenue 360 as their CEO, attracted most notably by the mission of a patient-centered model of care where no one's turned away based on their ability to pay, um, that works towards quality, compassionate health care, promoting healthy people and communities, but notably also addresses health disparities, focusing on Houston's underserved communities, whether it's people of color, the LGBTQ plus community, uninsured, unstably housed, or the homeless. What I found here and what I find in this agency is that we recognize that a small portion of what impacts an individual's health actually happens behind the exam room doors. So much of what actually impacts an individual's health are the social determinants of health. And so a core element of our vision is how do we work with other organizations to remove bar barriers to healthcare? How do we gather community feedback to improve healthcare? And how do we address health disparities in our community and its many driving forces? And some of those driving forces are those big hairy problems that it's hard to talk about and even harder to solve. You know, this year, as we look back on George Floyd's death, it highlighted a racist system that Black Americans have endured for decades in virtually all areas of our culture, criminal justice, business, politics, healthcare, finance, housing. As we watch teens and adults experiencing higher levels of discrimination and raising their levels of stress in society, chipping away and chipping away at dignity and respect, 
Even within the hallowed halls of health systems, we see both implicit and explicit bias amongst clinical teams, front desk staff, and across the gamut. And so when George Floyd was murdered, you know, members of my agency asked, well, are you going to put out a statement? Everyone's putting out statements as part of their racist response, race, their response to racism. And I said, no, we're not going to put out a statement. We are going to take action. You see, we had the privilege of having one of our clinics being housed on the campus of the church, Fountain of Praise, where uh, George Floyd's funeral took place. And so as I had the opportunity to attend uh, the, the, the funeral and to talk with the people in line and to see the cultural diversity that had gathered to celebrate the life and to call for change in our community, I said, let's see, what can we do to be a part of this dialogue? And let's talk about that which we know, which is inequity in healthcare. And so we pulled together a virtual panel on racism and inequity in healthcare that week to try to start talking not just about the problems that exist, but how we could be a part of the solution and how we could call forth solutions from our colleagues across the city and the state, whether it's from funders like Community Health Choice or whether it's from universities like one of our HBCUs, Texas Southern University, or whether it's at the largest safety net institution in the county Harris Health System, or whether it's one of the foundations, um, the Episcopal Health Foundation that's funding um, cutting edge healthcare initiatives. And we as an agency um, double down on our mission of addressing the social determinants of health, even as we, as we examine and address health challenges. In 2020, we helped provide stable housing to over 500 families. Um, and in doing so, nearly 100% of those families experienced residential stability for six months or longer. This is being the change you want to see. When we realized that these individuals didn't have access to telemedicine because they actually didn't have stable Wi-Fi or have computers, we provided on-site telemedicine services um, within some of the apartment units where many of these individuals were housed. In fact, we're one of the only federally qualified health centers in the country and the only one in the region that integrates housing into its, our healthcare practice. When we watched um, in the face of COVID and in the face of the oil and gas crisis, people losing their jobs and the rates of food insecurity going through the roof. Um, we started working with the Houston Food Bank to address food insecurity, providing food to over 300 families every month. As we realized that without food, people wouldn't prioritize their medication. You see, we are focused on being solution oriented. Now, whether it's removing administrative and linguistic barriers, whether it's increasing practices that educate our community and educate our patient population and allow them to play a role in the care process, whether it's strengthening patient provider relationships, increasing the numbers of underrepresented minorities in health professions. And I don't just mean medical assistants and front desk staff, I also mean clinicians and pharmacists, being thoughtful in our hiring processes. Um, to not incentivize care that is efficient, but not thoughtful and not culturally sensitive by providing implicit bias training and cultural competency, but then also holding team members accountable when they fall short of that, not in ways that denigrate the challenges that they're experiencing in working in a space where cultural competency is valued, but providing the additional training for them to help them move through their stages of change. Engaging with our social work team and our community health workers to build trust, which has always been critical in healthcare, especially as you reflect on our history, um, current and past of challenges in healthcare amongst people in, of color even more so important in our current political and informational environment. And then being involved in policy, um, being a voice to expand Medicaid in our state, um, to expand access to the Affordable Care Act, to um, expand economic growth and make it clear that a COVID response without economic response is not a response at all. And so as I think about this, concept of galvanizing communities for a healthier 
tomorrow, I would challenge all of you to consider health as the World Health Organization defines it, as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. That health is not merely the absence of disease. And in our search for a healthier tomorrow and a healthier today, we cannot stop with just advancing healthcare, but we also must engage in addressing some of these other challenges that our communities face, as ugly as they may be. We must have the patience to ask the hard questions and hear the answers even when they are articulated in ways that require cultural translation. And that cultural translation is necessary on both sides of the political aisle. We must honor the communities in which we work. That means engaging them in their care and in study and in research that's well designed and respectful, in advisory processes that are not just by name only, but actually impact how care is provided. And that when changes are made, they are made in ways that are respectful of the communities that you're impacting. It means paying attention to how you pay your staff when you staff your agencies with people from the community and then have the gall to underpay them. So being attentive to managing resources so you can uh, pay those resources forward into those communities. Um, whether it's to work at a federally qualified health center as I have, um, where you know today there are over a thousand federally qualified health centers in the United States, but it always wasn't like that. Um, Back in the 1960s, Lyndon Johnson um, revealed the Special Economic Opportunity Act and neighborhood health centers emerged from that. And in the 70s, the Community Health Center Act was passed um, with uh, Section 330 of the Public Health Act, um, the Public Health Service Act, which now funds our agency and yours. And in the 90s, the Health Center Consolidation Act said, you know, these are primary care centers. And um, part of the mission has to be to bring together migrants and homeless individuals and community and public housing, um, primary health care programs. And then in the 2000s, um, there were changes that said, listen, you can't deny patients access because of their inability to pay. And in 2010, with the passing of the Affordable Care Act, once again, it was highlighted that FQHCs, federally qualified health centers are a safety net and are a critical element of so-called medically underserved areas. And now uh, we serve over 20 million patients a year in the United States. However, our work is not yet done. And so as I have the honor and the privilege of closing out your health equity series of meeting people where they are and building awareness of health disparities. I'll share one small story more. On the day that it went public that George Floyd was killed, I came home and I had um, heard it actually on NPR and seen the news clip and I was in my bathroom, taking off my earrings and wiping off my lipstick. And my son walked into the bathroom and he looked down. He's 12 years old. And so, you know, 12 year olds can be a little moody. Son, what's wrong? Nothing, mom, fine. Son, what's wrong? You don't, you don't seem okay. And he said, well, I'm fine, mom. I said, son, you're not fine. What's going on? Is it, do you know about this whole George Floyd thing? Is that what's upsetting you? And he said, mom, what's sad is, I'm not upset, I'm just not surprised. I don't often become speechless, but at that moment I was speechless. I said, what do I say to this 12 year old young man um, who's not surprised that a man was killed in cold, cold blood in the street? So I took some time to think about it. And the next day at dinner, I sat down with him and my husband and our three children. And we talked about what our city and our country was experiencing. And I said to my children, we do not have the luxury of despair. Despair is a luxury. As we see the ugliness that's in the world put on display before us in ways that are unavoidable, and as we experience it in our own personal lives, my call for you as my children is that you never reside in a space of despair, but that you always be the change that you want to see. 
And so today, as we consider how do we galvanize communities for a healthier tomorrow, that starts with me and that starts with you. It starts with what you do in your household, what you do at your job, what you do at your grocery store and as you walk down the street. And it starts with being bold enough to say, I am going to make powerful change in this community that I am blessed to engage in. Whether it's ending the HIV epidemic, whether it's creating housing equity, whether it's being the best you that you can be, that's where it starts. So at this time, I'd like to uh, open the floor to Attorney Powell's questions and thank you all for the privilege of sharing my story and hopefully providing some food for thought. No, thank you, Dr. Flash. Thank you so much for such a broad and, and, and informative presentation. As you were talking, I was taking notes and there are a few areas of follow-up that I wanted to, uh, to address with you, some areas that I thought that we could elaborate on, uh, especially those areas of, of unity of interest that you have with Philadelphia Fight. Um, your FQHC is Avenue 360 Health and Wellness. Tell me a little more about that. You know, what, what, what are you most proud of, um, of the work that you're doing at Avenue 360? Wow, there's a lot to talk about. I love Avenue 360. I think that which I am most proud of is my staff. I have an amazing team of individuals who are fully mission oriented. And I often tell the leaders in my agency um, that it's important to evaluate people based on their talent and their competency and their capacity. But there are certain core characteristics that you cannot teach. And so as you hire, I want you to look for people that are on mission, people that care, that are hardworking and are driven. Those are the things that you cannot teach. And if you develop a team with those core principles, then you will develop an agency that's great. And that as you spend time as leaders developing yourself, um, that you will also create greatness in the agency. And I share with them that I spend as much time studying how to become a better leader as I do on any of the activities that the agency does, because the activities start with the people. You know, I'm proud of our AIDS hospice, one of the first hospices in the state. Um, I'm proud of our housing program um, that houses over 500 families. I am proud of our adult day activities program. It's a small program, but it addresses loneliness and social isolation for individuals um, who have HIV and other comorbidities um, and provides food and transportation for them. I'm proud of the work that each uh, clinician and medical assistant does as they compassionately care for individuals who otherwise might not be able to access care. I'm proud of our pharmacists who during the freeze a couple of weeks ago actually home delivered medication to people's homes to make sure that they did not miss out on their medication when the entire city was shut down for a week. Um, so I am most proud of the people and even all of the unsung heroes that work in the back office and we don't get a chance to see or talk about, but they're what make the wheels turn um, in the agency. So I am really proud of the people. I have an amazing team. Along those lines, there was a slide and one of the bullets was increase underrepresented minorities in health professions. And you know, we all know that there's a dearth of people of color and a dearth of underrepresented folks in community health. As a first generation black student myself, you know, my argument is always that, hey, for most of us or for a lot of us, we need to do well before we can do good. You know, when you're first generation and there are different priorities that are set based upon you know, your background and who you are. What would you say to an African-American or any student from an underrepresented background who wants to go into community health? which probably isn't the area that's going to pay you the most, but obviously areas, an area that you may feel fulfilled in. You know, but what advice would you give to a person of color or someone from an underrepresented population who wants to go into community health? Hmm. So you, that's a very rich question. There are a couple of things there. I, for myself, for my family and for my team, I believe in well, fostering a culture of learning. And so things aren't just gonna appear before you, you have to, fight for them, you have to learn as much as you can about them. And so developing that culture of learning and that culture of excellence, striving to learn more so that you can do better, so you can actually do well um, is critically important. I tell my own personal story as someone who's never 
chased a dollar. In fact, my uh, my mother would uh, berate me regularly that you know if you were a dermatologist or an oncologist, you sure would make a lot more money. And I said, yes, but where I am right now, I make a lot more impact. And as the years have gone by, the salary has increased. And somehow I've been blessed to make positive change. And then as I follow that passion, the money follows. Um, in part, money was never the thing that I was chasing though. What I was chasing was being a person that was making positive change. And that because of all of the the death and loss that I had seen and experienced, recognizing that each day is precious. And so if this is my last conversation, have I made an impact on those who have heard my voice? Um, for those who want to be engaged in community health, I in, encourage them to um, be involved with communities, um, to check their perspective. Some people I think feel as though they're going to go and save people, um, whether it's in Sub-Saharan Africa or in inner city schools or inner city clinics. Um, you're not here to save people. You're here to work alongside people, to be partners in their health. So be sure to work shoulder to shoulder in those communities and hear their stories so that you can help inspire and engage them in partnering with their health. Because you can write as many prescriptions as you want. If you cannot communicate with the community and get them to understand why you are prescribing this medication, um, it's just not going to happen. The, the other area that jumped out at me, obviously, is HIV and AIDS. Philadelphia fight is historically rooted in the fight against HIV and AIDS. Uh, that is the underserved population that you know we speak the most about and that folks know us for. So you said something at the very beginning that was very bold and audacious, okay? You said that when you were young, you just thought, I want to end the HIV epidemic. Where did you find your voice? You know, what, 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 what about your upbringing gave you the, the, the gumption to set such a lofty goal and obviously to, to accomplish as much as you've done today? You know, that's a good question because now looking back, I recognize that it was a little wacky, right? I said, I wanna end AIDS or cure cancer. And so what is the fabric that creates a child that has those types of lofty dreams? Um, I, don't, I don't know. I, I would say, you know, I have amazing parents um, who, who pushed, pushed and inspired. I, you know, I have a father who would say, you know, you come from good stock. He would say with his Jamaican accent, Charlene, you come from good stock. <laughs> In any room, I want you be, to be the smartest, the fastest, and the most beautiful. Go. <laughs> right. And so, I mean, I think that it was, uh, that constant drive and inspiration to be great. And they were completely not accepting of any level of mediocrity or even good. If you came home with a 93, they would say, where are the other seven points? Mm -hmm. um, I got accepted to every school I applied to. And they said, of course you did. Um, where are you going, Yale or Harvard, right? And so the, the level of expectation was quite high. And so I think, um, I don't think every child thrives under that level of pressure, um, but for some reason um, I did. And so that created the kind of person who would make bold, audacious goals. You said something earlier to, as well that jumped out at me and it was the hush hush nature of the epidemic in, in the beginning, especially in the African-American community. Um, you know, I, I can tell you the first time that I heard of AIDS, it was always under the concept or it, with the quotation, oh, they died of AIDS. But you never really understood what all that meant. Share with us, you know, a little bit about the stigma, especially in the African-American community. Is that something that's changed over the years? Um, you know, what, 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 where are we now in terms of the stigma of HIV and AIDS, especially in underrepresented communities? You know, it is always a challenge to make broad statements about communities because we are, there is so much diversity within our community. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I would say is that stigma is shifting as more and more people are becoming bold enough to say, I have HIV, I am living with HIV. And as people are having that discourse and people say, wow, that person looks like me and they've got two kids and a house and a job and they don't have three heads or whatever the imagining is, um, that someone who has experienced the monster, how they are, how they are going to present or, or, um, or be. 
Um, I think that that helps uh, address stigma. I think that, you know, as we, as a community, look at how in the gay community, there was advocacy that happened that was very vocal and frontal. And that in our community, our participation in that advocacy wasn't always front and center. And that because of that silence um, and that lack of voice, in part, that allowed our community to be left behind. And so even as new tools emerge, like PrEP, for example, um, I would find that white gay men would come find me. They'd Google me, they'd email, I'd get phone calls. I hear you're prescribing PrEP in the city. I would like some. Um, when I would talk in the black community, they didn't even know PrEP existed, right? And so part of that is this lack of dialogue that's driven by stigma within the community. Um, what I tell folks as I, you know, I do work in HIV in the South um, and, uh, yeah, I, it, where sex education is not where it should be in many spaces. And some of this work happens in houses of faith. And I lead with, you have no hope of jumping a hurdle you haven't looked at. Mm. So until we're able to have the conversations and talk about what is HIV, how is it transmitted and who are these people, um, that is how we are going to work towards destigmatizing this disease. And we also have to, you know, get comfortable with talking about sexual health. Um, I, it's interesting, as someone that's from the Caribbean, I, um, my family's from the Caribbean, I notice that uh, in the Caribbean, conversations about sexuality do not seem to be as repressed as they are in the United States. Um, and so this lack of sex positivity actually is just driving the epidemic that, you know, if any of us really reflect and sit back and think thoughtfully, if we have an absent or unhealthy sex life, we don't feel fully healthy. Mm -hmm. And so recognizing that sexuality is a part of health and that a part of being able to have healthy sexuality is to recognize whether I'm, what I'm uh, at risk for or not, whether that's pregnancy when I'm not ready for it or an STD when I'm not ready for it or HIV or whatever it is. And so to really have those real conversations and that people can have those conversations regardless of how they self-identify. And that, you know, sometimes we focus on limiting the conversation to people that we, you know, oh, well, he's gay. So I'm going to go talk with him about HIV. No, we got to talk about HIV to everybody. I talk about HIV to grandmothers and to children, to white people, to black people, to Latin people, to Asian people, because in order to demystify this disease and in, in, in order to undermine stigma, we have to be able to have these conversations. When Viagra came out, everybody knew about the purple pill. Your 90 year old grandmother knew about the purple pill and your teenager knew about the purple pill. Right. Okay. And so that's the kind of, uh, the dialogue that we should be having about things like access to treatment, access to prevention, condoms, we need to bring the dialogue so that everybody kind of know, knows and that you can actually talk about it, joke about it, have dis true discourse about it. That's how you problem solve and destigmatize entities. It's part of why I said in this talk, I probably used the word racism 10 times because if we cannot articulate the challenges that we're trying to face, we have no chance of solving them. Thank you. you. You hit on two very important points. The first of which is that, yeah, as a people, we're not monolithic, right? And that there are different levels of competencies, even among the African-American community. So I, I couched the question in that way because I knew that you would highlight that point. The other thing that I want to do is to take a step back because you mentioned PrEP. You know, the title of this presentation or this speaker series is Meeting People Where They Are. There might be folks in the audience who've never heard of PrEP, don't know what pre-exposure prophylaxis is. So Tell it to me like a fifth grader. You know, if I'd never heard of PrEP, what exactly is that? What is it used for? And what does it mean for the HIV and AIDS epidemic? Great. So fifth grader, <laughs> uh, there's a disease. There's this disease, it's called HIV. And you can get it if you have a sex with another person without being thoughtful and protecting yourself. And some of the ways um, that people protect themselves are by making a barrier or protection between me and you. 
but um, when you're having sex, but now we have a medication that creates a medical barrier between one person and another. And that medication is a one tablet once a day that people can take to, to, be, to build that barrier of protection to protect them from becoming infected with HIV. It allows, well, you know, if he were seventh, if he were a seventh grader, I'd go on to talk about how um, it also allows people to have decreased stress and anxiety um, when they engage in sexual activity in the context of a community where there are high rates of HIV. Um, yeah. Uh, you, you you also mentioned you know that that uh, especially gay white men would reach out to you and they would actively solicit you know you for prep and to and to ask questions about it when you have these conversations um you know you, you focus on women women of color you know is that conversation different what are some of the barriers that are presented and i'm asking you specifically about women of color because i understand that that is you know a, a population that that you are very attuned to is that discussion different and if so you know how um, the, the, the basics of the conversation are the same. I think the difference is I'm having the conversation. Um, you know, uh, some of my research on the implementation of PrEP in primary care settings involved um, focus groups and individual interviews with clinicians who, uh, uh, many of these clinicians said things like, you know, I feel as though if I introduce a topic like PrEP to a woman of color, that she's going to believe that I'm saying something about her relationship or about um, I'm calling her a loose woman, um, or that I'm, you know, I'm casting aspersions if I ask her questions of that nature, as opposed to coming from the perspective that I'm just informing someone about the realities of what's out there in the community where they reside. And um, one of the things that I talk with folks about is um, when I talk to women, first off, when you talk to women about PrEP, um, often they say, how come I've never heard of this before? And why hasn't someone told me? And they get mad. Right, because they are not informed. That's that's usually the first response that happens. Um, the second response is uh, for people who don't understand the rates of HIV in their community and they want to understand what that's all about because they recognize that people in the Black community aren't necessarily, um, you know, having more unprotected, uh, more condomless sex than other people, and so they don't understand why their rates are higher. And so I, I often will tell them a story. Um, you know, I take a, I say, suppose we're sitting in a room, there are two tables of people. We're going to call them orange and green people because when I say black and white, it makes you all nervous. Um, so the orange people and the green people, there are 10 people at a table. I'm going to give one of them HIV at each table. At table number one, um, the person gets a flu like illness and they tell their boss, hey, I'm going to um, take the rest of the day off. I need to go see my doc. I don't feel well. They go to their doctor, they get their uh, rapid HIV test. In 15 minutes, they know that they're HIV positive. They go downstairs to the pharmacy, they take out their insurance card and they get their prescription for antiretrovirals. They get in their car and they drive back to their home where they tell uh, their, their, their uh, sexual partner, God, goodness gracious, I've just been diagnosed with HIV. I'm on medication, but you should get tested. Um, this is where you can go. That person gets tested. Um, thankfully, they are not positive. And so the chain stops there. That person gets on PrEP, no one else on the table gets infected with HIV. That's the orange table. At the green table, individual gets up with the same flu-like illness. They're at a job where they can't just go over to their boss and say, I'm gonna take the rest of the day off. They're an hourly worker. If they don't work, they don't get paid. So they keep working. The symptoms subside as it does with HIV. And uh, they, couple uh, months to years later, they're getting the dwindles. So their wife is like, what's wrong with you? Why are you always tired? Why is our sex life different? You just feel like you're never in the mood anymore. Their partner gets mad, starts having sex with other people, goes for comfort to the neighbor. Um, it's like, I just don't know what's going on over the last three to four years. I think he doesn't love me anymore. He always says he's tired, he's losing weight. Um, and I'm not sure what's going on. Well, eventually they get a divorce index patient seek solace with someone else. So now we have four people at that table who are infected with HIV. They weren't particularly promiscuous. Um, it wasn't anything about who they were. I only gave HIV to one person at the table and the ease of transmission was no different. 
but this man could not leave his job because he was an hourly worker. He did not get have access to testing so that he could identify what was going on. That woman, when she complained to her clinician that something was happening, and when she got her first STD um, from the, you know, stepping out on her partner, the doctor never tested her for HIV because he said she's going to get upset if I even talk to her about HIV because she's going to think I'm calling her a loose woman. So all of a sudden, 40% of that table has HIV and only 10% of the other table has HIV. When you talk about it in that context, you realize that it wasn't anything biological. It was the job, it was the car, it was the insurance, it was the conversation and the stigma. And that's what's happening in communities of color in the United States. Um, why, it's, why HIV is burgeoning in certain communities and is well controlled in others, though we can have debates about the differences in sexual activity and risk in educational levels and things of that nature. And that's why a part of the conversation is talking about um, rates of HIV, talking about sexual health, talking about, are you sure your partner has no other partners, but also talking to individuals about, listen, do you have stability in your life? Are you doing what you need to do to be well employed and well engaged and have access to the care that you need? Do you know that these safety nets even exist and are available to you? All of that has to be part of the communication, which is why it can't just be me as the clinician, right? It's why my team is so important. My medical assistant, my social worker, my front desk person, my eligibility person, each individual on the chain is critically important to the success of that individual patient. And by definition, that community that you're serving. We, we have some questions here uh, to pivot a bit uh, to the issue of homelessness and your housing unstable population. Uh, there's a comment here that said providing stable housing is so amazing. Housing is healthcare. Can you share more in the last few minutes here about how you would manage how you manage your housing healthcare? Is it for patients only? And then they say mega kudos. Oh well, thank you for the mega kudos. Um, so we actually it's a, it's a, under the same umbrella of our organization, but it's a separate program where individuals who are unstably housed in the city of Houston all go through a coordinated access program. So you'll go and you say, hey, I'm unstably housed and they'll assign you to agencies. So we might not necessarily get assigned someone who actually is our patient in one of our clinics, but even so we may be the, the agency that's providing um, access to housing for them and then providing ongoing case management to help the individual have stability in that housing. Because just as in healthcare, just putting somebody into a house without giving them the tools they need to be successful in staying stably housed is a useless exercise. Um, and so I think one of the things that's um, really laudable about my team is that they really accent on the support element of supportive housing. I mean, we've had individuals, you take somebody from under the bridge, you put them in the house. Um, one gentleman slept on the floor for several days because he didn't really, hadn't really slept on a bed in years. Um, another individual, she was like, I really don't, I feel like I should be cleaning my house, but I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And the case manager went over and gave her an education on how you actually clean your house. So the support elements of that are an important part and speak to the hard work of a team that goes above and beyond to not just find a place where the person can lay their head, but also help that person support them through the process of being housed. Uh, I, someone here um, had asked a very good question, just to, to go back to PrEP. Um, they, they wanted to know whether or not you would recommend any prescription of PrEP as opposed to another. Uh, I would respond to that person on your behalf to say that I'm sure that each person is different and that you, know, you probably want to talk to your provider about what your options are and what might be best for you. Uh, we have providers here at Philadelphia Fight that obviously can, can help uh, answer that question. And I'm sure Dr. Flash uh, would also make herself available if you had any questions for follow-up at the end. Uh, but that probably would depend upon your own unique circumstances. Um, our CEO here asked a question uh, to pivot again a bit to COVID and vaccine hesitancy. Uh, she writes, one of the problems in addressing so-called vaccine hes hesitancy in low-income communities especially among African-Americans and other people of color, is that their lived experience is precisely what the government has lied to them about, and they've exploited them over and over about health issues. The research you described, Agent Orange among Vietnam vets. There were some scandal about inoculations during the Iraq war. We in Philadelphia have a very serious history of experimentation in the local jails and so on, so that they have not so that they not so much 
they don't have a lot of reason to believe in the government now. How would you address this? How do we address this in the context of COVID vaccine? So a loaded question, but I'm, I, I think that to boil it down, the question is about, co about uh, vaccination hesitancy. How do we address uh, hesitancy in light of the historical racism that you mentioned earlier on in your presentation? Excellent question. You know, I think that some of uh, the slow uptake of vaccination in the community of color, some of it has historical context, much of it does not. Um, that I think that um, in the community of color, when you look at uh, the fact that you have a vaccine that was developed in a relatively short amount of time, and then is being disseminated out into the community very rapidly and only has an emergency use authorization that people are understandably cautious. And so, you know, when I am talking about um, this perception of vaccine hesitancy, I say, well, you know what? It's actually a part of that cultural translation is having the dialogue that it actually is logical to be cautious about something that came to you quickly and is being pushed out fast and has an emergency use authorization. And so the best approach is actually to acknowledge that, that yes, this happened quickly. And um, yes, um, it's unusual. It's the, the fastest vaccine we've ever developed. Um, and yes, it's only under an emergency use authorization. So when I talk to the community and when I talk to individual patients, I start by acknowledging all of that. And I actually share that I also, even as an infectious disease physician was thoughtful about, hmm, is this gonna work? because we have to acknowledge and not, you know, we have to not be paternalistic in our approach and embrace for these individuals um, that their thoughts and perceptions have validity. For some, it is couched in historical context, but for others, it's just like, I don't know. It just kind of seems kind of fast. So then after we kind of get through that and we can now have a dialogue because now I have acknowledged their lived experience, then I share, listen, this is the same country that sent a man to the moon. Um, when we have a large challenges and we corral our resources, we are able to respond quickly when we want to. And when we're faced with profound economic um, destruction for of our nation's economy, one of the greatest economies in the world was brought to its knees by this disease. Heck yeah, they moved fast to try to figure out how to bring this thing under control. And that the three vaccines that we see brought forth were three out of 200 candidates. Um, and so although it seems like they, this happened fast, yes, it did, but it's only a fraction of all the different opportunities that were tested in trial to come out with a couple that will work well. Yes, we do, it is emergency use authorization. You're correct. Yes, there may be long-term side effects that I don't know about. But what I can tell you that I do know about is the impact of COVID right now. And so we have to have that dialogue of the risk benefit ratio. And that's why when this fiasco with the Johnson and Johnson vaccine and the, and the, and the clotting happened, folks okay. were said, well, what do you think of that? And I said, well, I told you that there could be effects that we don't know, but we have to do this if we're going to save our community, if we're gonna get to the space where we can look at each other's smiles and faces again and get rid of these masks and where we can engage in our jobs and not social distance because by definition, we are a social community and that means we have to have a coming together. And so we got to take that step of faith so that we can get back to the new normal. And so just having that real dialogue, which can be uncomfortable because it means that you're going to have to admit that some of this happened fast. There are some levels of uncertainty and just be honest about that. And I think that uh, the community, my community, um, it it can see that transparency. It can, when you're, when you are not just talking, um, but that sincerity of like, yeah, no, you're right. I understand. And here's what I think about that. What do you think about it? Last question for you, Dr. Flash. You know, this conversation, conversations about health inequity in general can feel heavy. You know, we've talked about HIV, we've talked about COVID, we've talked about disparities more so than we probably talk about equity nowadays. What are the silver linings? Are there any silver linings? How can we leave this conversation feeling good about where we are? You know. Or better uh, about where we are. Yeah, so you know what, what's interesting and maybe I'm just different. I, I as, a, as a girl, I ran track, right? And so this, this example of the looking at the hurdle before you jump it. 
And so, you know, before you got to run a mile, you run three. And after you've run three miles and you can run the three miles easily, when it comes time to run the one mile, you know, I got this because I ran three miles yesterday. So I know I could run this one mile. Having this conversation is like running the three miles, right? For us to overcome these challenges, we have to measure them. We have to talk about them. We have to have the uncomfortable conversation until it's no longer uncomfortable, until when we see it, we call it out and we act on it. Um, I, for one, am no longer for a season where we're going to just talk about health disparities and not come up with the plan and do something about it. So that's why I don't just talk about racism without talking about how do you do things that are anti-racist. I don't talk about homelessness without talking about housing. I don't talk about food insecurity without talking about a food drive. I don't talk about poor health with talking, without talking about what's the solution to bring health to the community. Stopping at the problem and not imagining what the potential solution can be is it's the space where we get trapped in that small mindedness, right? It's what my child tried to do when he said, well, I'm not surprised. It was the challenge that I gave him that, dude, the world is hard. Life is hard. Struggle is what makes you grow. It makes you tough. Now go out there and fight and figure out the struggle and figure out how you are going to make a change. Don't let life happen to you. Racism, homelessness, inequity. You have agency. Each of us has agency each day to make change in our own lives and how we engage with people and in the lives of the people that we encounter, we have, we make choices. Every day we make choices as to, am I gonna walk past that homeless person and not see them? Or am I gonna engage them as a human being and figure out what their needs are? Am I too busy? Am I rushing to the movie I'm going to or to the store or whatever it is that I don't have time to engage with that individual? We make choices. And in those choices and in that agency, that's where the hope lies. Hope is having faith that we can have a positive future and that even though we don't see it now in the real that you see it here in your mind and in your heart and that you're willing to do the work to create that the reality of that imagery be the change you want to be if if i if there was a takeaway from your presentation today that's what i would say be the change you want to be and there's someone in the audience who agrees that says that it was an amazing presentation and thank you so much for uh presenting for us today uh you know this has been an amazing month for us here at Philadelphia Fight because this has been the first conference of this type that we've had. And, you know, we've had in the triple digits each week folks who are coming out and there's a real thirst and uh, desire for this information. So, you know, I've learned a lot in terms of presenting and when you have an audience in front of you, you always do a call to action, right? You don't bring people into the room and talk at them. You leave them with a call to action. You say, based upon what I've learned, what I've gathered from this these talks, you know, this is what we want you to do. I would encourage you to educate yourselves. Educate yourselves about your communities and ways that you can be involved. Know your community stance on racial equity. Know your community stance on healthcare equity. You may live in one of those cities, counties, or states where nearly 200 declarations of racism as a public health crisis have been issued. Philadelphia is one of those cities. These places are developing plans and they're collaborating with communities to address the effects of racism on housing, as you mentioned, healthcare, education, and the economy. Community health systems like ours and like yours, hospitals and even insurers nowadays are also addressing racial equity in local communities through strategic investments. In addition, your state could have a health department that has an office of minority health or office of health equity. And there are state executives that have been setting up task forces and creating new offices and all these new positions dedicated to racial equity. So my call to action to all of you would be to stay informed, use your voice, and above all, meet people where they are. Thank you all so much for joining us. We're really excited that you've decided to spend your lunch time with us. There's someone here who's going to leave us uh, with the last word. And it is someone from Houston who says, Houston is proud, exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. Thank you, Dr. Flash. I echo those sentiments. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. And we're looking forward to developing more relationships like this with your organization, which I've deemed our sibling FQHC. So yes. thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Flash. And thanks to all of you for joining us. And we will see you here again next year for the Meeting People Where You Are Health Equity Conference. Thanks a lot.